Okay. Hello. Welcome. I want to make sure you're in the right place. This is for the C-Build webinar on GM evaluation. Um, and Bentley, if we could have the next slide. <clears throat> So this webinar is part of the CBUILD program, which is a comprehensive suite of resources for boards of directors of food cooperatives. This webinar is one of the resources, but there are many other um, ways that we provide support to food co-op boards. This webinar is going to be available on the CBUILD webpage. There's a library link on that page, which you can find by following the link shown on the screen. And if we could go to the next slide. I am in the green in the far left. Bentley, who is our technical support today, is in the right shirt up behind my shoulder. Um, the material that we're presenting today has been prepared by Mark Gehring, who is in the upper right of the, not the very upper, that's Carolee, but in the man in the upper right is Mark Gehring, who, with Carolee Coulter, who's peeking over Mark's shoulder up there in the corner. Um, prepared the materials for today's webinar. Um, Carolee has much experience in human resources and works closely with our C-Build team of consultants shown here. Um, and this is who we are. Today we are very grateful to have, in addition to Carolee, we have two guests, um, Sharon Murphy from Whole Foods Co-op in Duluth, where she's the general manager, and John Hatton, who is the board president of the Food Co-op in Brattleboro. Carolee, if you could introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll ask uh, Sharon and John to say a few words, we can get started. Okay. Um, well, I've been uh, consulting for co-ops for 25 years. I joined CBS Consulting Co-op this year, and before I was a consultant, I was a member of a worker co-op, and I worked in a, in a consumer co-op also, and um, I have been in the human resources area of consulting all that time. Um, I travel around the country. I should now say I travel around North America now that I'm living in Canada and work with co-ops who have better uh, HR systems and the evaluation of the general manager is part of that. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Sharon. I'm Sharon Murphy. I'm the general manager at Whole Foods Co-op in Duluth. My 29-year tenure at this co-op has spanned two types of man management structures, three different locations, annual sales growth from 350000 a year to just shy of $10 million. And I've been accountable to well over 100 board members during that time. Ouch. Most of Sharon! <laughs> most of whom had little co-op business or supervisory experience, uh, which was fine in 1980 because I didn't either. <laughs> yes, wow. <things> have changed. <laughs> John? Yep, I'm John Hatton. I'm the board president of the Brattleboro Food Co-op. I've been involved with co-op since 1991 when I came to Brattleboro and started working for Northeast Cooperatives. Um, and when Northeast was subsumed by United Natural Foods, I went on to the Brattleboro Board. I'm now in my sixth year. We have three-year terms and three-term term limits. So I'm going to run again for re-election in November, and I've been board president for, I think, the last four years now. Wonderful. Welcome. Carolee, do you want to kick us off here? Yes. Yeah. Um, want to go to the next slide? Um, we're going to be trying to accomplish this for this webinar. Um, as a result of this webinar, we would like to all of you directors and general managers that you know the key principles to management evaluation, that you think of effective GM evaluation as an ongoing process, not just a once a year thing, and that's based on pre established criteria. And we'll go over the rigorous and reasonable method of checking. Um, the, we want boards to come out of this having an effective process they can use. And also we want for you all to understand how an effective evaluation process is separate from but connected to an effective compensation process. So let's go on. Let's, let's start with the key principles. Yeah. 
Um, some of these principles, if your board is using policy governance, you're probably going to be doing this, or at least you're aiming for it. Speaking with one voice, regardless of the kind of governance you use, is absolutely crucial when it comes to an evaluation. I remember uh, John, your general manager, telling me years ago, back in the 90s one time, that he had received an evaluation from his board, and on some criterion, um, four people had rated him excellent, and two had rated him good, and two had rated him satisfactory, and one had rated him unsatisfactory. And that was the evaluation, you know, in, in each criterion that went on like that. What was he supposed to do with that? The board needs to speak with one voice on an evaluation to say, here is your evaluation, this is what we think. Another key principle of management evaluations is no surprises. But um, Sharon, you tell us about why surprises can happen. Well, one of the reasons surprises happen is because there's board turnover. And it occurred to me as I was reviewing this program that Despite the fact that we have a very organized and extensive board orientation, we don't talk about the general manager evaluation process in board orientation. So for some board members, the first knowledge that they have of, of what we're going to be doing or, you know, that we're reviewing a contract and reviewing performance is just comes on them cold. And, um, they revert to whatever experience they may have had in their own lives or if they came on the board with a specific intent and they um, passion something they were passionate about and they feel like it isn't getting enough attention, it's very easy to sidetrack the evaluation process and it's not fun. And of course one reason why surprises can happen too is when the board makes up the rules at the rules at the end instead of the beginning. Um, one time, uh, one night, I got a call from a board president who said, we're evaluating our general manager tomorrow. Do you have a form we could use? Uh, the, the, the idea that, oh, but now we decide what we're going to evaluate you on, that's not going to lead to trust and confidence between the manager and the board. Um, and then another principle is that the general manager's performance is the co-op performance. If the co-op is doing well, then that is saying the general manager is doing a good job. If the co-op is doing badly by any of the criteria that the board has set, that's the general manager's responsibility as well. And we will elaborate on the, some of these principles more as we go. The last one is giving positive reinforcement where it's due. Uh, it, um, easy for a group of people to go through a whole year without letting a general manager know how much they appreciate her or his contributions. Evaluation is a time and that can be set. So let's look at the process. Can we go to the next slide? We see this as a circular process. We start out with expectations or pre-established criteria and they get written down, and they are the policy. There's a schedule by which the board monitors uh, the, to see that the policies are in fact being complied with. This happens over the course of a year, policy by policy. Then when it comes time to the evaluation, the board summarizes the results of the monitoring process, and that's a snapshot of the year all at once. And has the manager been in compliance with all of our policies? And then the board has a meeting and affirms the results from the evaluation and makes a communication to the general manager about the board's um, satisfaction or lack of satisfaction with what has been revealed into the monitoring process. We'll now go through all of these steps. So let's move on. Saying, take it. Next slide, then, Emily. So here's an overview of the first step in the process. Um, it's important to have expectations and to write them down. Next slide. 
you have to check, do you have the policies that you need and want? Because evaluation is only meaningful if you have set the right expectations. There's a template of policies that the CBIL team has recently developed, and that's on the CBIL library, which you can find on the CBIL webpage. And that's a great place to start to check um, whether or not you have the right policies. One of my boards was recently complaining to their general manager that the monitoring reports were very redundant and boring, and the general manager said, well, look at your policies. They say the same thing over and over again, so no wonder. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one example. But it's actually a very serious matter that um, those written expectations actually be aligned with what the board really expects to see from the cooperative. Next slide. So the key to the whole system is an effective board process. The board needs to speak with one voice. That is tremendously important, as Sharon reinforced. Um, the board needs to be professional, not just in setting its expectations at the beginning of the process, but also in maintaining appropriate confidentiality, in uh, being clear about the expectations that it's setting so that it can give positive reinforcement where, um, where it's appropriate. And if there's other reinforcement or other follow-up needed, that the board is able to do that and do that with one voice. Remember, where the board has delegated responsibility for operational matters to its general manager in writing, then it's always important to remember, um, as Carol Lee said, that the general manager's performance is equivalent to a co-op performance. Here's the next slide. I just want to show a couple samples from the CBUILD template policies. Here's a written statement of expectations uh, from the general manager, just making it clear, as I just said, in writing now, that the board is going to use GM performance as identical to organizational performance. What that means is if the board is using policy governance is that the board is expecting the general manager to achieve the ends that it has written down in its policy manual and avoid the proscribed, I love that word, but the forbidden means. Um, and if the general manager accomplishes the ends, avoid the forbidden means, then performance has been successful. Next slide. Here's another sample from the CBO template. This one states the expectations around the evaluation of the general manager. So in my dream, Sharon, when that new board member comes on, my dream is that the first thing they would do is sit down in their purple t-shirt that says I am accountable for everything that happens when it's co-op um, and read the whole policy manual. That's one of Mark's, one of my very favorite of Mark's articles has to do with how board members should prepare for their <laughs> meetings. Um, but reading the policy manual is tremendously helpful if the board has set the right policies. And here, this board, this imaginary board, has very clearly stated how it intends to evaluate the general manager based on its summary of monitoring reports from, and it specifies the period, specifies the time frame for the board making its decision, and also goes on and links the process to the GM compensation process and establishes a date for doing that. That's a nice example of clearly spelled expectations. Next slide. So, so <clears throat> um, this is Carol here. Um, so the next step of that cycle that we talked about for the GM evaluation is that there'll be a schedule throughout the course of the year by which the board will check on compliance on the different policies. And by becoming proficient in the monitoring process like that and getting regular, uh, learning how to read and knowing what to ask for and monitoring reports, boards can also help managers comply by uh, getting more clear about what they want. Um, and over the course of the year, month by month, policy by policy, the general manager's evaluation is actually happening. It's not going to be a once-a-year thing. It's actually happening with every board meeting. A piece of the general manager's performance is being evaluated in the monitoring report. And by doing this, 
the board frees itself up so it has time to work on the juicy stuff, um, the, the leadership stuff, taking the co-op forward, finding its direction, achieving its end. Let's look at the next slide. There's a, we want, also want to uh, refer you to a webinar that Mark conducted on acting on GM monitoring reports that will flesh out this, have a great deal more to say about monitoring. Okay, let's move on to the next. So here's a key step, and there are a number of key steps throughout, you know, this process. So, um, so stay excited, okay? But here's one of the coolest things. Um, after the board has gone through its cycle of monitoring its expectations of the GM through the course of a period, a calendar year, whatever, a fiscal year, the next step, the next tangible thing the board needs to do to get, to get ready to evaluate its general manager is to provide, to prepare a table that summarizes the results of the monitoring throughout the course of the year. Can you show the next slide, Ben? So this is really exciting because this table summarizes an imaginary year's worth of monitoring. On the left-hand column, you have the policy name, and then on the remaining columns, you have the results of the board's action on that policy, and then you have some comments in the far right-hand column just providing more detail about what happened to refresh the board's memory. Sharon, Does anybody you talk about what you, you I'm sorry. No, I was going to ask Sharon, or does anyone have a board who uses this, Sharon or John? Our board uses something um, similar to this, not quite the same number of columns. It's kind of tied into their their calendar, but they actually have a, a general manager evaluation committee that sits down with this report four times a year, every quarter and goes over it so that it is an ongoing process and it's not, um, there's not a bunch of bad news all at one time and there's opportunity to, um, there's opportunity for me as the general manager to achieve compliance maybe on something that I did two quarters ago that the report wasn't so great. I can come back to them and say, well, I have achieved some progress here and my action plan was successful or not um, and let them know. Interesting. At Brattleboro, we, we use a chart similar to this. We have an administrative ass assistant who takes minutes at the meetings, and, and she keeps track of the monitoring reports, the GM monitoring reports. Um, and so when it gets time to the GM evaluation, uh, she'll put together this same kind of chart and, and show how the board responded, how they moved on each one of the GM monitoring reports. Uh, and basically, that is the GM evaluation. I think that's great, and I like your suggestion of using a board administrator. That's a that's a good technique because one of the things, or for doing it periodically, like quarterly, updating the table, Sharon. Because one of the things that I think can seem burdensome to a board that's you know trying to keep its head above water just barely um, is coming to the end of the year, getting ready to do its evaluation of its GM, and realizing that that means going through a year's worth of minutes to figure out what action it took on. But monitoring the courts. So figuring out how to keep track of that on an ongoing basis, I think, is a good best practice. Here's another really key tool. Can we go to the next slide? I really like this because what this does is provide a note of professionalism to the board's activity, and it formalizes um, what it's engaged in when it prepares that summary table. So here's a sample memo from the board secretary to the rest of the board of directors, uh, just certifying that the table that's attached um, has been checked against the minutes and that it's accurate. So that gives the board a good starting point to launch into the next step of the evaluation process. Next slide. Could we probably move on to saying that we have a question from uh, John. Uh, so, the question is, some of our directors have suggested using the toolbox book on GM evaluations as opposed to using a summation of the manager's monitoring report. What are your thoughts on that? Carly, I'm not familiar with the toolbox, are you? Well, you know, there's, um, 
there's an old toolbox that I wrote back about 10 years ago, and it had, and a part of it is from Maryland on how to use policy governance for the valuation. Uh, both Maryland and I would say that our thinking has advanced quite a bit in the last 10 years. And so I would no longer recommend that toolbox. I think that it could be confusing. Uh, to go back to that now, I, I would want to revise that toolbox now, if I could, um, rather than have it out there as being the recommended process. Because we've had a lot more experience now with policy governance, and um, I, I think that the last 10 years have taught us a great deal. Yeah, I think from, from my point of view, at that as the board president at Brattleboro, um, we have policy governance and, and we've weighed down. Back in the earlier slide, it said basically the, the GM's performance is equivalent to the store's performance. The way we hold the GM accountable is through these monitoring reports of the, the GM policies, basically. And, and so that's, we try and keep it pretty strictly to that. And, and actually we had a recent experience where at the end of, of, the summation basically going through the reports and saying, you know, we, we accepted all of the reports as being in compliance. And I said, you know, does anybody have anything else that they want to say or talk about with our GM's performance? And it opened up this can of worms and we couldn't get out of there for the next hour because everybody got, we just dove right into micromanagement, which I think is what policy governance has saved boards from. So I, I prefer to stick to the pretty, black and white structure of this is what we did with all the GM monitoring reports, all reported compliance board accepted them all, successful evaluation. And one thing that I'll say, because Mark isn't here to say it, but uh, Mark said this to me recently, it was tremendously clarifying, um, because I've had board members say to me, well, you know, the general manager is in compliance with everything, but we're not satisfied with his or her performance. And what Mark would say is, if you have high compliance but low trust between the board and the general manager, then either the board accepted monitoring reports that they should not have accepted, or they need different policies. So I, we'll come back to that idea when we see some scenarios that we'll be talking about. But I want you to keep, think about that. You know, like if, if you have a, if there's a disconnect going on between compliance with all the policies, but still there's feelings on the board that they're not satisfied with the general manager, then we need to go back and look at the policies or look at the monitoring report. Well, well, shall we move on? Um, this is a, an idealized uh, process, or I, I don't mean that it's unachievable in the real world, but uh, in designing this, we thought this was a, uh, it's a way the calendar would work if you had a fiscal year that, that went from July 1st to June 30th, and if you had board elections in October. It would be ideal to have the results of the uh, fiscal year to be considered in the evaluation year end. Um, but it also is really important to have uh, not to be doing the general manager evaluation in the middle of board turnover. And so that that would not that would be incredibly disruptive. So what we're suggesting here is okay, you have your policies, they're in effect all the time. But then in August so your fiscal year ends in in June thirtieth and by August uh, hopefully, you would have your all of your ends reports and your fiscal year and financial condition reports presented. So remember, the general manager's performance equals the co-op's performance. So now, um, in August, the board gets those monitoring reports and also in that August meeting previews the process and says, okay, the general manager's evaluation is going to be at the next meeting. Remember, all of the monitoring reports, and here's the table, and this is what we're going to be going through. And at that point, um, 
the, the board secretary is going to do that certification letter and get that table all together, or, unless the board administrator has already done that. But whoever is delegated with the task gets it ready. And then in September, at that board meeting, the board has an executive session, and they look at the table showing the um, monitoring report results, just like that check sheet we saw a few slides ago. Uh, they they have the certification from the secretary saying yes, this is this is in fact what we decided on all of these monitoring reports. And then, as a result of that meeting, they're going to give a letter from the board to the GM that's based on the data in the monitoring table. Well, what would be the content of that letter? That would depend on what on the state of the co-op and what had been going on. We're going to go through four different scenarios now and show you what that monitoring table might look like and what that letter from the board to the general manager might look like. So, okay. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Let's skip ahead another slide then. Okay. Yes, I can't remember. Um, I'm sorry. This is, um, I, I, excuse me. I finished this. So, yes, yep. the last and then the one yeah. more. Yeah. One more slide. And so, I just want to emphasize this piece, um, Carolee, because this is, I think this is another one of those key tools that the, that, um, that I love about this presentation, um, because this letter from the board bringing summation to the process is something the board can use to professionalize and formalize the results of its evaluation process. So this is the fun part. Let's do examples, okay? Let's do the next slide. We'll do our first example. And it's absolutely essential that you pay attention to the names of these co-ops because they are deeply fun, okay? Um, but here's a sample table for Golden Grains Cooperative. And Golden Grains, um, you know, we're going to pretend that everybody's using this, this annual format. And look, all the monitoring reports came in on time, first of all, in that third column. Yes, they all came in on time. They all had reasonable interpretations, and they're always supported by adequate data. Were they all showing compliance? Yes, at Golden Grains they were, but I would say to you that in some cases, this might be an excellent showing, even if some of these policies were not in compliance, particularly ends where you have multiple ends where there is something the co-op is working towards might be that you might not have compliance and you still might have excellent performance. There are comments here showing that the manager was you know, praised for the EMS report, um, some notes about changes to the policies which the GM is still catching up with. Um, but overall, this is a very positive picture. And so if you look at the next slide, here is the key tool in action. This is a letter from the board to the general manager at Golden Grain saying, Looks great. Good job. Uh, keep up the good work. Some special notes. We appreciate the effort into the good uh, board GM relationship. And I just want to throw in a note that the most important relationship, there are two key relationships in the cooperative. First of all, the relationships within the board are essential because if the board cannot speak with one voice, then it's unable to be effective. So good group process is very important. But the next and the equally key relationship is between the board and the general manager. And everybody needs to work to make that successful. So this note here in the letter to the GM at Golden Greens is, is really high praise. So, so let me chime in there because I think Brattleboro Co-op gets to be the Golden Greens in this conversation. Uh, we have a great GM. We had he has excellent monitoring reports, and he always feels like he needs to work on them more, so he keeps improving them. Uh, good data. We were, he was reported compliance on on each one of his monitoring reports. The board accepted each one of them, and we got to the end. And as we have every year, and and said thanks very much. You know, successful evaluation. Um, and we went into executive session and talked about, you know, what did we want to say further? And, and we sort of did this letter, but took it a couple of steps further. And, and so I asked each of the board members to submit basically what they want to say to our general manager. And we ended up with probably, we have 11 board members, we had 11 bullet points of different things, what we felt the, the strength 
strengths of the GM were. So, you know, besides just saying you had a successful positive evaluation, this is what we really think of you and what it's like to work with you. And the last letter um, for his GM evaluation, we framed it actually and gave it to him. And so he's got it on his wall in his office. That's great, because being able to say something specific and meaningful is so much better than uh, just general statements. Sharon, did you have any perspective on Well, I thought we were the Golden Greens co-op. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, no I think problem. there's more than one. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the letter is a great idea. Um, it's really nice to have. Um, not that I'm looking to move on or anything, but one of the things that you can, it's almost like a letter of reference if you were planning to move on. It would be a great thing to have a copy of for yourself um, to read on the bad days and mm -hmm. to stick in with your resume if you decide to move on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and it is, <laughs> Charlie? Yeah, it's great when you, it's great when you're golden grains, but what if you're not? We're now going to go to the, the opposite scenario, bear market. Bear market co-op, well, there's a number of problems here. Yes, monitoring reports were submitted. Yes, they were submitted on time. Um, were they reasonable interpretations? Well, one of the ends policies wasn't. Or some of them weren't. And uh, so there were some problems with the ends policies. But uh, what we see also is that when we look at the financial condition, the business planning and financial budgeting, and the asset protection policy, out of compliance. And so now we, there's a need to fill in some of these other comments here. And how serious are these? Well, they're pretty serious. So the severity of the noncompliance is noted here. And then the action taken. On that ENDS policy, you'll see the board rejected three parts of the ENDS report as being inadequate and gave the manager 90 days to make, to represent. Um, then on the financial condition policy, well, we had one in February, one in May, one in August, and each time we have uh, the board accepts the report showing noncompliance, and, you know, there's no change in financial conditions. The first time in February when the board, when the manager was out of compliance on financial conditions, they presented a six-month action plan. But, look, six months have gone by, and well, here's August, and it's not good. So, um... What happens, and then when we look down under asset protection, we think, oh, retained earnings are eroding. We've got a serious financial situation going on at their market. So when the board meets in executive session, when they come up with their letter, this is what it's going to look like. The next slide. So it's pretty serious. So, as you know, this boy says to the general manager from the annual monitoring table, we agree, you're out of compliance on financial condition and asset protection. And we didn't think your progress, you made adequate progress in fixing that. And six months ago, you submitted a plan, and if those plans had been successful, you would have come back into compliance with the financial condition policies, and that would have contributed towards compliance on those end policies. Um, but the data in your most recently submitted monitoring report, no improvement. And the financial situation is continuing to deteriorate. And we don't see a plan. We don't see how you're going to turn this around, is what the board is saying to the general manager. So, gulp. Last point. The board has decided to place you on 90-day probation, effective today. And if the terms of probation are not met, you'll be subject to termination. And then they have an attached document that goes through the terms of probation. Now, this would be extremely serious. And, you know, depending on the real-life circumstances, there might have been um, 
you know, maybe in some boards they might have terminated the general manager instead of putting them on the 90 day probation, but maybe this board is choosing to do this for various reasons. I mean, maybe they want to give themselves some time to get a backup plan together or who knows. They're giving themselves, a, that's what they chose, the 90 days. But this is an option. And if things really are that bad, this could be an outcome of an evaluation. It's very unusual, though. Anybody ever uh, been in a bear market situation? It's a good thing that they had compliance on their emergency GM succession policy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might, might need to use that one. <laughs> yep. So this is this is a very grim scenario, and we think this is not what's usually going to happen. But we do want to show that this would be if, in fact, you had a, a monitoring table that looked like that at the end of the year. That this would be a very reasonable reaction for the board to do. So an evaluation can result in disciplinary action in effect. Does anyone have any questions about that concept of putting the general manager on probation? So what kind of conditions do people use on that probation? I mean, do they tie it back to the policy? Yes, and they might say, we want a plan, we want, it, but we want another plan, we want it by this time, we want, um, you know, if um, they might um, say, we want, um, I mean, if, if I have to think about this because it's so very rare that I've ever had to do it. Much more often a board just fires a general manager actually, in that circumstances. I've, I've seen that more than the probation. But it might be also, you know, to what extent this is confidential um, and uh, because that's a very big issue to be decided here. I mean, is everyone going to know or not? Um, and what are... Um, how much progress do we need to see? I mean, uh, for instance, in 90 days, is it reasonable to think that you'll come back into profitability? No, but are you seeing enough of a positive trend? So that so the conditions might spell that out, the, I mean, the terms of the probation. Okay, we, we want to see at least this much progress. That's great, thank you. I just like to encourage all the participants to ask any questions uh, as we go along here too. I'll be monitoring them to pass them along. Shall we well, go to the next slide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, this is this is in some ways my favorite co-op because I have a great deal of sympathy for this co-op because I really really like to be right and I really like to be compliant. I like to be good. Um, and so this table is just beautiful. The board has been doing its monitoring, it's been liking the interpretations, liking the data. And then something happened when it went into the executive session. Can you go to the next slide? When the board went into executive session, it realized that actually the table didn't actually represent how the board understood the GM or the co-op's performance to date. And so as they began to discuss it, they realized that they had accepted reports, basically, that they should never have accepted. They saw that the ENDS report, for example, didn't have adequate interpretations and the data wasn't sufficient. So the board, in this letter to, to the general manager at Wake Up Co-op, is saying, Wow, you know, we accept responsibility for approving those end reports, but in the future, we intend to pull up our socks, and we would like you to give us some media reporting on the end so that we can, you know, take this more seriously, so that we can correct it. Um, so this is asking now specifically for correction on that monitoring in the end, um, and asking for um, specific goals to from the GM to be used to measure the, the accomplishment at the end. And that piece is always very important. And I think 
you know, the key that I want to stress here, because I do see some of my boards, especially ones that are new to policy governance, stumbling here. It's hard enough to get familiar with the policy register, to get familiar with the idea of accepting any reasonable interpretation of the policy. And that next step of requiring adequate data, what does data look like? And what is good enough? And how can we, as mere array board people, know whether or not data is good enough? Um, I think often we fail to trust our instincts and our common sense um, as board members and can get, get a little bit paralyzed. So here's the board waking up and saying, you know, you've got another monitoring report on planning, and we want to see that your planning is connected up with the M. And everything else was good. We appreciate what you're doing, and, you know, we intend to do better in the future. So this is an important co-op. Uh, and then I'd like to uh, throw in an example here. I was talking to a board member. Uh, it was on the issue of staff treatment. And this board member said, well, so the general manager just says, I'm in compliance, and we're supposed to just take that? And there's all these staff people coming to us to complain. And, and, and wait a minute, wait a minute. The manager just said, I'm in compliance, and you just accepted that? And this, that's the point. The board is taking here in Wake Up Co-op, the board is taking some responsibility because the board is going, like, oh, we haven't held up our end. And, and so that's remember. kind of an important piece. It's not just this process of evaluating the general manager is an opportunity for the board to do some self-reflection as well, reflecting, as Carolee said, on whether or not it has the right policies, but also reflecting on how good a job it's doing in monitoring those policies. And in fact, if it, this board, it, what, may, what might have happened, we can imagine, is that when this board went into executive session, there, that can of worms got open that you know, John talked about happening in Brattleboro Court. The can of worms got open, the worms crawled out, and there they realized that they didn't have the tools to put the worms back in the can or whatever, because they didn't, because they had, had inadequate monitoring reports and had been accepting them. And so again, this is a situation where if you have low trust but high compliance, go back and say, did we accept monitoring reports we shouldn't have accepted, or do we have the wrong policies? And we don't know if we have the wrong policies until we actually take a good, honest try at holding up the standards for monitoring reports. Once we get some good data and we get a good monitoring report, then we can decide whether we have the right policies or not. If we still aren't satisfied with what you know with the with the performance of the co-op. Hey, Carolee, this is John again. I think in our case, we actually have high trust and and strong monitoring reports, but right. there's always sort of this nagging suspicion that you know, did we ask the staff? You know, or should we be doing a staff survey? Should should we be getting more information? Um, and that's where we went awry. And and like you said, it was hard to get the the cans back or the worms back inside the can because we just went down that road when in fact we had a structure we had agreed upon. This is what the process is. Um, but once I opened that door, uh, you know, it's hard for us to go back for a while until we figured it out. And staff treatment is one of those areas that tends to get, where this kind of thing tends to happen a lot. Sure. Yeah, you know, where you get uh, compliance on the staff treatment monitoring report, but board members hear scuttlebutt or, you know, or they just wonder that they really aren't sure. They have, they really aren't satisfied with the data they got. They shouldn't have accepted the report then. But we hope that the example of Wake Up Co-op here shows everybody that it's never too late to fix the problem. So we can't go back and penalize this manager now for monitoring reports that weren't good enough that we accepted at the time. You know, we, we can't do that. That wouldn't be fair. But going forward, we're telling the manager that we're going to actually be having higher standards now. And that's really fair because, again, it's making up the rules at the beginning instead of the end. So I think going forward, from here on out, we really do want monitoring reports of data. Also, we go to... And here's another co-op that woke up. Smell the coffee co-op. 
smell the coffee cup. Well, let's look at what's happened here. Um, they didn't get any reports at all on ends. They didn't get them on, uh, they really didn't get them on anything except financial conditions. Now, they got all those. Oh, they got member equity and benefits. Looks like this manager puts a priority on things financial and has delivered monitoring reports on those things. But, uh, in many cases, look at all those question marks. There's no data, there's no report, there's no way to tell if it's some reasonable interpretation. No data was provided. And the ones that were provided, yes, they were, they were adequate. So, um, the board got nothing on and and they, they they just went ahead and completely and said no compliance on the communication and support to the board policy because they felt that the very act of not getting a report from the manager was itself that, uh, the data that showed them non-compliance. But for the other things we just had to go in, hey, we don't know, we don't have an answer right now because we don't have anything, any data to go on. So, what do you think will happen when Smell the Coffee board goes into executive session? They're not going to pick it up. Definitely yeah. cranky. Definitely <laughs> cranky. Yeah. <laughs> they need their coffee. So, they go into the executive session and they come out with the following letter. Well. Wow. He said, we, we found it difficult to complete your evaluation. Um, we did find you out of compliance on that board communication and support report, uh, support policy. Um, and uh, that except for financial conditions, you failed to submit the monitoring reports that were required, or they were very late. Um, so this is what we've done. We've attached a revised monitoring schedule. This is going forward, in other words, we're going to put you on an accelerated monitoring schedule and we want to begin getting these reports we haven't been getting. And they are going to allow the manager to negotiate some of them on the schedule. They can please inform the board chair of any modifications to this new schedule that you feel are necessary. But they're making a statement here to their manager that uh, this isn't okay with us, this has to change. And so we're telling you really clearly now, we need these monitoring reports and we're not going to wait till it just all comes around again in the regular cycle. It's not like a uh, wake up co-op, which you know, basically they, they realized, okay, it's, it's our responsibility. We need to um, go um, forward demanding better data, better monitoring reports. But in the case of Smell the Coffee Co-op, we haven't been getting the reports at all, so we're saying we've got to start getting those. And then in six months, we're going to review your progress on getting the reports in. And so we're, going to, we're basically extending your evaluation period is what we're doing here. And, and in terms of your compensation, and we'll have more to say about compensation in a little bit, um, your compensation isn't going to change. We're not going to give you a request for a proposal on on new compensation or anything. We, we're going to go through another six months and see what happens. And, you know, it's not, we can't make you get help on your monitoring report, but we can make you give us monitoring reports that we suggest you get help. So this is a very, you know, commanding letter in a way. It's very, and it's very appropriate for the board to be giving its manager this to say, well, we, you've been, basically, you've been defying us, and we're acknowledging that as that's not okay. But it's all said in a very professional, clear-cut, objective way. And so this is great this from my perspective. Because what it means is the board isn't doesn't get stuck, and I think that's the you know the greatest um, hurdle that boards can reach when they realize that something hasn't gone quite the way it should have gone. The question is, what do we do now? Um, and boards can get in stuck in endless loops of asking again and again, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis for reports or 
reviewing reports that they have um, injected and never quite come to closure on the what does this mean and how are we going to move forward? How do we communicate the seriousness of this? So my very favorite piece, can we go back a slide, Bentley? My very favorite piece of this is the B7 there. Um, they didn't get a report on the communication of support to the board, and I love that piece. If we didn't get a report, we know that there's no compliance. Okay, you can go ahead. I also wanted to say that this board, oh, could we go back for a moment to, um, yeah, a smell the coffee. This board is actually doing this manager a favor. I can think of a more than one situation where a board did not hold the manager's feet to the fire on getting the monitoring reports in or allowed the reports to be delayed, 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 and problems that the monitoring reports might have reflected and given the board a heads up on were not reported to the board. And then when they finally burst out into the light of day, um, the board felt taken by surprise and, you know, and that they were very upset with the manager and it did lead to the manager Leave, it led to a, a mutual agreement on termination, shall we say, um, that could have been prevented if the board had been holding the manager to the monitoring schedule all along. I'm not saying that that would have fixed those performance problems, perhaps. It may or may not have, but at least it wouldn't have led to this situation of, um, we, you know, we're, we've, had, we've been in the dark and now we're finding out there's all these problems and you didn't tell us. So they actually are being kind, or you know, they're being appropriate with their manager to say, we need this, and we're not going to just take no for an answer. We're not going to just allow this to slide on by. Can we go back a slide again, Bentley? I'm sorry. Because, Carolee, that brings up a question to me. You know, here, it seems to me um, the board is kind of safe in, in uh, giving that, if you will, that consideration to the manager here where it has all its monitoring on the financial condition. So it's not wondering how the organization is doing financially. It has that information. But what would be appropriate if, you know, these financial reports hadn't been submitted all well, year? Wait, I'm not understanding the question. Um, if, the, if the general manager hadn't submitted the B1 uh, report, mm -hmm. the financial condition and activity, so those were all? Uh, not submitted? Well, I, w I would have thought the board wouldn't be waiting for the evaluation to... Um, Thank start. you, that was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just say, you know, they would have been saying, well, so when are you getting, you know, when are we getting this? Uh, I, I wouldn't expect them to wait a year. Yes, and I just wanted to point that out because I have worked with a board in the past that got caught in a loop where, you know, there was a good reason why the financials weren't ready in February and it wasn't the GM's fault. And they weren't ready again in May, but they were certainly going to be ready by July, but then they weren't ready by August. And oh, I've heard that. No, yeah. I've heard of situations like that. So, so I just wanted to... Um, wanted to hear from you who I trust and respect that it's okay at a certain point to the board to say, no, this isn't all right. Well, I think the board the board always has the right, doesn't it, to say to the manager, we need our monitoring reports now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But an evaluation often is a wake-up call for a board to say, oh, we've let this slide too long. And in right. the case of smell the coffee co-op, I think the reason why they might have let it slide that long is it, things were okay financially. Yes. Yeah, just a technical question on the slide regarding B1 in the November reporting being in, in uh, 2008 rather than 2009. Oops, I think that's supposed to be a nine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, 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 it, it is. Well, I, I don't know why the November wouldn't be above the February, but I think the idea right. is this is for a fiscal oh. year that ends in... Um, in uh, July. Well, anyway, that, that it's... Or June. Yeah, but I don't know why it would be in that order. They probably could have been in the other order, but it was consistent on all of them, and I figured it out. Yeah. Let's okay. <laughs> <than ever. laughs> so, so the bottom line response is it's for a fiscal year, um, mm -hmm. so we're, we're overlapping the year. I see. Okay. okay. Well, we skip. 
We apologize for this, but uh, this was uh, a chart. Mark, if Mark was here, he could, he might have another explanation for it, but right now I can't tell you anything different. So I don't know why it was like that, but I, I thought it was perhaps because it was about, you know, a fiscal year that's not lined up with a calendar year, but then it seems like the November would be above the February, so it doesn't make sense. It's probably a mistake. Minor, minor point. We'll, we'll, we'll Ready for the next slide? Yeah, if you could skip a couple ahead so we go back to the process review. Yeah. Because um, I'm delighted we're right on track and going to be able to move into the discussion of how we link this process up to the GM compensation process, which Mark and Carol Lee did an excellent webinar about before. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to review this process. Again, so starting in the blue, key and cornerstone at the very beginning of the process is to have written expectations uh, before the evaluation period even begins so that there are no surprises. Uh, in the green, to go ahead and have a monitoring schedule so that annually the board is reviewing performance of the general manager on an ongoing basis. And then on an ongoing basis, I'd recommend a good best practice is to be summarizing the results of that monitoring process. Um, so that at the end of the year, uh, the board has an annual summary of the results of all its monitoring, which the secretary can attest is accurate as to the board's activities through the year. And then the board has an opportunity in the purple box to affirm the summary results. They have an executive session meeting to discuss whether or not the uh, annual table is consistent with their understanding of how the, the organization, the general manager, is performing. Um, and then plan and prepare a summary letter which um, takes into account the annual snapshot and provides clear guidance, either clearly positive reinforcement to the general manager or states clearly what steps uh, the board expects to see and on what time frame to follow up. Can you go to the next slide, Wendley? So, the desired outcomes of the evaluation are shown here on the slide. Um, most important is that there are written clear steps uh, that the board has communicated to the general manager about what is going to follow after the evaluation. And if you could notice the fourth bullet here, records of the results of the evaluation should end up in the manager's personnel file. And I just sat right up straight in one of our prep calls, Carolee, when you pointed out how important it is for a personnel file to exist for the general manager. So that was something that wasn't on my radar. And of course, that is the board's responsibility since the general manager is the board's employee. And it's one employee typical. Um, the other things that can come out of the evaluation are identifying policies that the board is going to review in the future. Um, and also, the basis for the compensation proposal from the general manager in response to the board's compensation RFP. And Carolee, perhaps I'll turn it to you to talk about how the compensation process ties into the evaluation process, because that's a pretty common question. Before we change the slide and start talking about compensation, I just want to say a thing about employment contracts. Because we say if your co-op uses one, then the evaluation is usually the time when the contract is renewed. But we're not taking a position for or against contracts. You know, we're not, if it, the fact that you see the mention of a contract there, I don't want you to think, oh, you need, you need an employment contract for our general manager. You do not need that. Um, you don't have to have one. But for various reasons, some some boards and some general managers do want one or do choose to have one. So if you do, the evaluation um, you know, would, would obviously intersect with it. Okay. Only one question I see is where should the manager's personnel file actually be kept? Is that something that the board or the board secretary retains, or where does that physically live? Well. Um, I think that um, in, in, I have never I have never seen the general. No, I shouldn't say I've never seen the general. No, I don't think I've ever seen a general manager's personnel file sitting in the personnel file along with that of the other staff. So I 
would assume that it would be held by the board secretary and it would be passed on um, to each board secretary. Or I actually think that if there's proper security on the personnel file, that it could be kept among them and if you have a, if you have a professional if you're caught for you know, if you have a professional human resources manager that person should be tr you know trusted to be able to handle that um, yeah, that's, but, that's what happens with our co-op in Brattleboro we have a human resources person handle all of that we do too I, you I guys are old and green <laughs> There wouldn't be much confidentiality in, in turning it over from board secretary to board secretary kind of thing. Yeah, so it's there's not much confidentiality involved in personnel files, but I don't think we could maintain it with a volunteer board. No. Well, that's, that's a good point, but if you have a small co-op and no HR manager, that could be a problem, too. So. Maybe if the co-op has an accountant. That's a great idea. That is a great idea. Thank you. And it strikes me that boards could probably also use some guidance about the contents of that personnel file. So I'm just going to provide that for a future topic for us to provide some resources for. Because mm -hmm. what does a volunteer board know about personnel matters? Let me tell you, I'm not. And that can vary from state to state, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are the rules do vary on um, access to the personnel file you know, from state to state. But yeah, there. Well, let's not go there today about what exactly. To not today. Just flagging it as an issue. Yep. Okay. Well, let's talk about compensation. Now, um, Mark and I developed this webinar that we presented several times. And it's in the library, and we wrote an article also that's in Cooperative Grocer. And we basically laying out a four year cycle, and within that, a two year cycle. And the four year cycle starts with the board thinking strategically about general manager compensation. So there are, we have proposed a process for that that the board goes through including a part where the directors do some self-questioning outside of a board meeting on their approach to, on their feelings about money and compensation and how that might affect their ability to make decisions at the co-op. Sharon, do you want to talk about your co-op process on that? Uh, we did follow the chart this year. And that particular box, um, the director's complete individual questions, um, is just a real revelation um, in terms of creating a different atmosphere for the discussion. Um, our board president sent out an email with some sample suggestions. I think you must have provided those in your workshop. Um, yes. How to get the directors to start thinking about their relationship to money and compensation. And I just made myself a copy of it and started doing the same thing for myself and really recognized um, some of the barriers that I had put in front of myself in terms of having these discussions with boards in the past. And the whole tenor of the uh, discussion went well. And it isn't that I've had particularly confrontational situations before, it's just been awkward. And um, that was not the case this year. It was just very straightforward and uh, respectful and everybody, no one disclosed their personal responses to those questions. Like the whole process was just much more thoughtful and um, everyone participated. And that was very good. So thank you. Well, from the, and as you can see from the flow chart here, from people doing that individual self-questioning, and then the, uh, the board comes together to, with a goal of speaking with one voice on the importance of general manager compensation to the co-op. When, when we talk about thinking strategically, we're thinking about the really long term here. For example, you've had a general manager in place for years and years like at Brattleboro or Whole Foods, um, it, 
easy to go along with um, the continuing pretty low pay for a general manager in that situation, and then that general manager leaves, and you have to replace them, and oh my God, sticker shock when we go out into the labor market and start looking at people who have the skills and experience to take on the job as it has grown over all those years. So that's one reason to be thinking about compensation. It's not just about this individual person who is the general manager, but it's about you know, the impact of GM compensation on your co-op as a whole. So anyway, after the board has thought through those things and they develop criteria by which they would judge a GM compensation plan, then they put together a request for proposal to the GM and say to the GM, come back to us with a proposal that meets these criteria. One of the reasons why we were so excited to be able to have the general manager being the one to propose their own compensation to the board instead of the board trying to decide what the general manager needs or wants and propose it to them. One reason why we like that so much is it really seems to be moving away from the um, adult-child model into more you know, adult-to-adult, adult, as I guess from parent-child, to adult-to-adult here. We're not taking care of you. You're taking care of yourself. You tell us what you need. And you tell us what motivates you. The boards can have very good intentions. They want to be, you know, they think, oh, well, if we offer this bonus, then maybe you know, the general manager will like this. And I've had general managers say to me, they never asked me what I thought. I think this bonus is silly. It doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't, I'm doing the very best job I can, and that bonus doesn't make any difference to me. But that's what they decide, and so that's what it is. And that's ridiculous. We don't need to have a situation like that. So with the manager being able to propose their own compensation, it, the manager knows what's motivating to him or her. And it's going to be a little different from one individual to the next, and I think that that's good. So but we, but we're saying that you don't have to go through that strategic conversation um, every, every year. To do that, uh, come up with your criteria, um, give, you know, put out the request for proposal to management, and then ask the manager to propose compensation over a two-year cycle. And then you can repeat that two-year cycle again. Uh, and then after four years have gone by, that would be a good time to go back and redo the strategic thinking piece because maybe things have changed in your environment and maybe people on the board have changed and want to be able to have a voice and listen and talk about it again. It also might be a, a, a slightly different structure if you had a new GM. You might, might not want to wait four yes. years to repeat the process with the new GM. That's a really good point. John, do you have anything to say about what you do at Brattleboro? Well, actually, this this last year we used this chart for the first time also. And and before that, um, we'd done a fair amount of research of, of talking to different GMs across the country to try and get a range of, you know, try, we're considered to be a large co-op, so we looked at other large co-ops and what the GM compensation package was. And we did a fair amount of research, and I think you're exactly right. You know, we came up with something that, um, that when we went through this process last year, we found out wasn't really motivating to our GM. Um, that, and so this time with the RFP and with the GM's proposal for his own compensation package, I think it was much more effective for everybody. Sharon, do you have anything you wanted to add about that? No. Okay. Well, uh, this webinar is available in the Seville Library. Um, we, we go on to the next slide to look at how the cycle of compensation could come together with a cycle of evaluation. This chart is really complicated, so we're going to take our time with it and see if this makes sense. Um, first of all, the blue line there on top, the board has policies that are always in effect. That just goes on. The green line there, that the green row represents the monitoring schedule. You know, in January we get the staff treatment monitoring report. In February we get financial condition. In March we get the membership, and so on. Um, so we're assuming again, this is our 
co-op that has the fiscal year July 1st through June 30th and board elections in October. So they come to, the, the year ends on June 30th and at the August board meeting, they've been very nice inefficient and uh, management has been and has year-end financial condition report. So the board presents, so at that point, they've been able to, um, to, to get that data to the board and the board reviews the fact that we're going to have this process for the evaluation and um, the, the memo and the table that delegated to the board secretary or whoever and then September they have their executive session. Now, and then they come out with their letter. Um, meanwhile, um, the the general, the, back to, the board has been doing the strategic thinking about the GM's compensation. And back in um, February, they had started their process on, on talking about GM compensation. They had their strategic conversation. They took two different board meetings to do it. They came up with an RFP and gave it to the general manager. That was back in May. So come August, the general manager is presenting her compensation proposal. And she knows at this point how well the co-op has done financially and she's, um, you know, she's ready to take that into account and uh, what she's asking for. So in September, when the board comes out with it, you know, it has its executive session and, and then um, it comes up with a point, talking points in their letter and everything, they also can have that compensation proposal to deal with at that time. But that's year one of a two-year cycle. So in year two, the board isn't going through the strategic conversa conversation. They've already done that. They're not giving an RFP because they asked the GM to make a proposal for a two-year cycle. So there isn't really anything that needs to be done about GM compensation in year two. The evaluation will still happen, just like it always does. But um, if the general manager's proposal contains some form of contingent pay that's based on meeting certain thresholds, then that there are annual triggers for that, like sales growth or profitability or what, customer count or getting an expansion done on time or under budget or whatever it was, then the, if the general manager did uh, propose that and the board approved it, year two would have that that, that contingency pay deal would happen in that year. Um, but there would be no compensation decision going on in year two. Year three, the board doesn't go back and do a strategic conversation. Not now. They, they did it two years ago. They're still riding on that. Um, but they will um, put out an RFP again to the manager saying, well, so submit your compensation proposal to us again, and uh, they decide what those criteria are and give it to the GM in May, and again, now in year three, same thing like year one. And then year four looks like year two because it was again a two-year cycle that the general manager's proposal was for. Year five, the board goes back and redoes the strategic thinking process and you know, renews and re Fines and perhaps fundamental changes, for all we know, it's going to change for what it wants to about the GM's compensation, about uh, its strategic importance for the co-op, and they're going to then give another RFP to the GM, and so on. Now, this is one way to do it, and we think it makes sense, but there's reasons to put the compensation and the evaluation on a different cycle. And uh, Sharon, maybe you can talk to that about why you um, that why you do it in a different time, why you do your compensation proposal in a different place. Um, it goes back a long way, but it um, we have the same fiscal year that you're using in the example, but from a budgeting standpoint, I always wanted to have the information about the contract if it was going to change before I went into the budget planning phase. So we back things up um, 
probably February or March, um, having the material, uh, the their final review of the of the monitoring schedule and the monitoring report outcomes, and then um, my evaluation was done in April this year, so that this month I can put together the budget. And this month is the month that um, is being May. The month that the board approves the contract also. Um, we've never, we get annual audits. We've never been quite as successful as your, um, as your plan here is for uh, getting audited results by August. You don't usually get them until fairly late in September, and September is the board election month. Mm -hmm. So, couldn't quite go by your calendar, but right. um, I can certainly take the steps and back them up. To work. Any comments or questions on this um, evaluation and compensation cycle? I'm just delighted to see how it all fits together and, and sort of how um, how you can get it synced up so that the evaluation process is feeding directly into that ongoing uh, GM compensation process because I think timing and planning is something, you know, usually it's the board leader often who takes responsibility for establishing uh, the agenda each month. Mm -hmm. and that's burdensome, and here, this is, you know, the kinds of considerations you've outlined in coming up with this uh, structure for a calendar is just very helpful because it models um, one way of balancing, you know, all the different things that the board is starting to accomplish because at the same time this is going on, of course, the board has other ongoing activities in terms of linking with its owners and, uh, you know, still the ongoing monitoring is continuing. Uh, so this is helpful for just providing a model of how how to look at that big picture and how important it is for the board to have a calendar each year so that it knows um, how it's going to get its work done. Because really, if you think about it, boards don't spend all that much time together compared to the amount of time the general manager spends in the store. Sharon, do you know do, do our GMs considering is there some support uh, among GMs about this with the RFP portion of this that they're developing or, or that their actual proposal? I haven't talked about it with anyone. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've had okay. general managers. I, I've had a few general managers ask me uh, for help with finding data or with help for uh, with, with you know with a response. Uh, very many have just, you know, told me they've been able to just walk right through it, but uh, I've had some contact me. So uh, on the GM side, I've uh, been providing help to some. That's good, because it is a it is a fairly sophisticated problem, and I have seen situations with fairly new general managers uh, kind of stumbling. At the mm -hmm. so it's good to know that you know your resource. Um, I mean, I think as the process is used more, um, people will be able to touch base with each other to see how it's how it's been going. Because I think the most exciting part of this compensation strategy is the creativity it motivates and inspires, so that a GM can actually design a compensation package that that's truly motivating and truly useful. Well, do we have any more questions or comments about compensation? Well, not at this time. Good. So why don't we move ahead and we'll summarize and then see if we can uh, have a little bit of discussion overall of what we've covered. Um, because here, just to review what we tried to accomplish tonight, we wanted to make sure that directors understood the key principles to management evaluation, understanding that to be effective, it needs to be an ongoing process that's based on criteria that are established in advance, and that there's a rigorous and reasonable method of checking whether or not there's compliance, so that it's not a once-a-year pro project. 
want to ensure that boards have an effective process, so that's what we tried to model here that they can use and understand how that evaluation process is separate from and yet does connect up to an interface with the uh, compensation process. Next slide. So that's what we've tried to accomplish tonight, and I just want to say a profound thank you to all of the panelists and my other presenters, but also to the attendees, because it's really your participation that is key into making this live session um, vital. So thank you for your questions. And if you have other questions, it would be great if you could use that little question function, um, because this is your chance to memorialize forever that one issue that's been bugging you. I've not seen any pressing questions. We've got 10 minutes remaining in our 90 minutes. Um, anybody out there have anything they'd like to ask? I think actually we've presented a lot of information, and so I'm not concerned if there aren't further questions about closing the session early. Do any of our panelists want to make any closing remarks? Not me. Um, no, I just I'd like to say thanks to CDS for putting this on. I think the C build workshops, the webinars, and the whole program is really a great resource for boards and for co-ops. Agreed. Okay. 